Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered who you really are, why you're here, and what you can do to make a difference in the world, then the we have the Discover Your Greatness and Change the World show for you. Today I'll be talking with Audrey Kitagawa, JD, the current chair of the UN Task Force and the Programmatic Areas Standing Committee of the Parliament of the World Religions, and she is the United Nations Representative for the United Religions Initiative and Chair Emerita of the NGO Committee on Spirituality, Values, and Global Concerns. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about discovering our own spirituality and greatness and how we can make a true difference in our own lives and the entire world. That, plus we'll talk about recusing judges and thick steel neck bands, five-hour talks and transmissions, capsules shot into the heart, one badass grandma, why the diamond and the dirt are always the same, and what in the world a thousand ascetics in India has to do with anything. So welcome to the show and aloha, Audrey. Are you ready to shine? Aloha and mahalo nui loa. Oh. I'm very pleased to be on this program and everyone is shining that inner brilliance that is already within you, the closest of all. Woohoo! Thank you, thank you, thank you. So today I want to share a little bit about your story and your work with the UN and then discover how we can discover our own greatness in the world. But before we do that, what's one thing we can do right now in this moment to begin discovering, rediscovering our true divine nature? Just think of it in this way. Uh, My spiritual mother said that God is love. So here, now, in every opportunity that we have, every moment that we live, through the loving thoughts, loving speech, loving actions, we actualize the reality of the living God in our own lives. That's what we can do here and now and all the time. I love it. I always have a some sort of a bracelet in my hand. And what I am always doing is circling through it going, I send love, I send love, I send love to help keep me in that centered place. And because it feels good for me and everybody around me. From there, where'd you grow up? And you were starting to tell me about something that happened in elementary school having to do with a ceiling. Oh, (laughs) well, when I was in elementary school, I was running a very high fever. I was very ill. And uh, suddenly I was floating on the ceiling. And I was looking down at the ill body of the little girl. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was not the body, that I was a consciousness Mm -hmm. that was a witness to all that is occurring on the screen of life. And next to me was God. And God was whispering to me the secrets of the universe. And one of the most profound whisperings that God gave to me was that every thought, every word, and every action is recorded. And that was, I guess, God's... (laughs) was God's way to let me know that uh, whatever we do is there is a record of it. So in any event, uh, in later life, I met uh, an enlightened master who told me that God is love. And therefore, that expression of love comes through every thought, every loving thought, every loving word and every loving action. How did you make sense of that in elementary school, and how did it change who or what you were you were, and your trajectory? All that in one. Well, it didn't really change me in the sense that uh, I was a very, very shy individual. People would say, you shy today? <laughs> but I was very shy. And uh, it was just an experience, a profound experience. I wasn't freaked out about it. It was just something that I accepted because I've had many profound mystical experiences from childhood. So I just accepted it as a natural part of my life. 
And uh, but when I was in the sixth grade, uh, I I was just so um, withdrawn and very timid. And the teacher announced uh, class next week. We're going to go on an excursion to your new intermediate school. And she said, you will now have a different teacher for yeah. each subject rather than having one teacher all day long. And I hit the panic button first, yeah. going to a new school. And she also explained that there'll be other students coming from other elementary schools going to the intermediate school. And I'm going, oh, a lot of strange new students. <laughs> and then a different teacher for every subject. And I was panicked. Because I like to have certainty, routine, familiarity, and all of a sudden I was going to move into this chaos. And um, it was recess. By then, I went outside, <clears throat> standing outside of the classroom and standing under the eaves of the classroom. The teacher was to my right and she was talking to another student. And I was in this silent panic. And I asked myself, am I going to be like this the rest of my life? And suddenly I shot out of my body into the air and did in microseconds like and came back into my body. And I knew I was a different person. In those microseconds, my whole worldview had changed. Suddenly, life was a grand adventure. It was nothing to be afraid of. It was wonderful and exciting. And it was just so awesome and profound to have a complete and radical shift in my worldview that I looked to the teacher and the student, and they were still talking. They didn't notice that something profound had happened. And so I was waiting for recess to be over because I thought surely my classmates would see that I was different. No, life went on. Mm -hmm. Nobody noticed anything different. So I thought surely when I go home, my family would see that I was different. And no, nobody saw that I was different. But I knew that I was different. Many, many years later, my mother, sitting at the dining table with me, looked at me and she said, you know, I could never understand how a crybaby like you ever became a lawyer. <laughs> and I never wow. bothered to explain to her what experience I had in the sixth grade that so radically shifted my worldview and transformed me from within. Woohoo! <laughs> we were talking off air about about the NDEs, the experiences I went through, and the woohoo and the childlike joy of looking at everything like a little kid, not not childish, childlike, came out of that experience. And it sounds like you were looking at the world as a shiny snow globe, in a sense, from that moment forward. Yes, it was a great adventure. That life was full of wonderful opportunities to grow, to develop, and to really experience this gift of sacred life in all of its dimensions. And I want to talk about that today and how we can begin to discover that. Before we do, you mentioned a teacher. Who was Flora Nomi? What was she known as and what did she mean to you? Well, that was her name, Flora Nomi, Tsuruyo Nomi. She was born in Waipahu in a little sugar plantation in uh, Hawaii on the island of Oahu. And uh, I met this uh, client of my brother-in-law's, mm -hmm. and this is just before I was going away to law school. And... Um, my brother-in-law was an insurance, he had his own insurance company, and he had to pay a you know, business visit to his client. And this client happened to be a huge uh, wholesaler of, um, you know, meats and, um, you know, seafood, etc. So we went to see him. And for some reason, he kept saying, you know, you have to meet my wife. She would just adore you. 
And so he made arrangements for me to meet with his wife, and she was lovely. I mean, he was also a very wonderful man. And she said, you know, Audrey, you are a sincere seeker after God, and you must meet this lady. And so in any event, uh, she gave me the, this lady's phone number and name, and uh, so I went to make arrangements to see her. And that was uh, Divine Mother. And she opened the door, took one look at me, and she said, you cannot serve two masters. And I immediately knew what she meant. In my heart, I knew what she meant. And then, you know, I sat down with her and she launched into a five-hour, nonstop exposition on the divine that one could ever have the privilege to hear. And she spoke in this beautiful language of the spirit, of the heart. And it was just, I fell in love with her. And I was with her thereafter for 20 years. Lots of questions. But first, this weekend alone, I've been thinking about this concept or it's been feeling or it's been a theme, serve two masters. In fact, it came up yesterday, a, a quote from the Bible. I don't even know how that, that chased me down yesterday from Jesus about serving two masters. Who was she referring to? Who were the two masters? One is the human side, and the other is the divine. And so I wanted from childhood to be a lawyer. And you know, the uh, lady of justice who holds the scales, Absolutely. and she's blindfolded. And they say that, uh, you know, she's, she's a very jealous uh, mistress. And I was very devoted to my law practice. Mm. And I um, ate, slept, and <laughs> breathed my law practice because my career was very important to me. But I also had a profound experience in my first year of law school where I had this visitation from a divine being. And in this remarkable, beautiful brilliant, radiant light of pure, unconditional love that was perfection. And there is no language that will ever accurately describe that pure and perfect love. And um, that divine being showed me many things and told me many things about the future, et cetera, et cetera, and the different stages of transformation. So um, I was left with a knowing that the day would come when I would have to give up my law career. But he didn't tell me when. So I just knew that it was going to happen. And also left with a knowing that when it happened, I would be so crystal clear. There would be no question in my mind that it was time to leave my law practice. And uh, then also he put a beggar's bag around me, which meant that thereafter I would have to live solely by the will of God. And wherever it was God's will to take me or send me, I would have to go. So I could not have any attachments that would keep me anchored to any one place, one person. You know, so I would have to just be like a leaf in the wind and go wherever the wind was blowing me. That's the wind of the divine. Wow. So let's dive into that, because I think there's a lot we can learn from this. First off, if we fast forward about 20, 21 years later, the wind of the divine knocked your diploma off the wall. That's true. <laughs> so I had a very active uh, trial practice, and I was busy at the office, as I usually was, and I was preparing for trial. And it was pretty late at night. And suddenly, my law diploma, which is quite huge, hanging happily on two nails anchored to the wall, suddenly dropped. It just fell off the wall. And I just knew, okay, it's time to close my law practice. And I looked at the diploma, and there wasn't a single crack in the glass. So I also had a knowing that whatever I learned from my law degree, my law experiences, that that would stand me in good stead all the days of my life. And shortly thereafter, very rapidly, I transferred all of my cases to um, an attorney, 
who I knew, very qualified, and he also agreed to take my uh, staff at the same benefits and salary. Mm -hmm. And I just immediately closed my office, and it happened so quickly. Um, I didn't say goodbye to anybody, not to any of my colleagues, uh, not to my family. I just closed my practice. And so um, that weekend, I was planning on visiting my mother to let her know that I had closed my law office because, you know, she worked very hard to send me to uh, college and law school. So in any event, um, the next day, however, early in the morning, I got a call. The phone rang. I picked it up. I said, hello. And it was my mother's voice. And she said, yes. And then I knew uh -oh. she knew. And she said, you know, I try to call your office and there was a recording that came on that this is a non-working number. She said, I called the telephone company. I fought with the telephone company <laughs> representative and said, there's some mistake. I love it. My daughter has had that number for over 20 years. And the lady said, I'm sorry, but it, you know, it doesn't seem as, she, as if she's in business anymore. So she called my brother who worked across the street at the judiciary and she said, you know, the, can't get your sister on the phone. There's something funny going on. Please walk across the street and find out what's happening. So he came across to my office and uh, he didn't see any light under the door mm -hmm. and the door was locked. So he knocked on the door. There was no answer. So he went back to his office, called my mother and said, you know, mom, I don't think she's in business anymore. <laughs> so in any event, I shared with my mother and she was very calm and very accepting. So then we ended the conversation and I thought that was easy. You know, because I was very concerned about having to tell her I closed my office. And uh, so I thought, wow, that was pretty easy. And I was pretty happy that she was just very quiet and accepting. But early the next morning, she called and she said, have you lost your mind? <laughs> Have you gone crazy? Oh, I couldn't sleep all night. What did you do? You closed your law practice. And 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 then on and on she went. <laughs> you go, mom. I can totally see this. I can totally see this. So you, you said you were living in or with a beggar's bag. Since we're talking today about discovering our own greatness, which is really discovering our design, a divine true self, how did you start to cultivate, where do I go? What do I do? Because you're saying blowing life a le like a leaf and you, you had been with your teacher for 20 years, which is actually very interesting, the timing of that. And at the same time, you were anchored, my guess is, to your law practice. Right. So, but then I knew when it was time to give my law practice up, that I just had to be open and receptive to wherever the divine will would take me. But the, uh, you know, uh, this actually is quite a mystical path uh, because a divine messenger uh, was actually sent to teach divine mother how to work with the light and also told, gave her, you know, several prophecies. And one of which was that the light had to go to the United Nations. So somewhere in the recesses of my mind, I knew that the United Nations was somewhere on the landscape. Mm. So, but I didn't know how that would manifest. But in any event, in 2000, um, the uh, State of the World Forum mm. wanted to have a convening outside of San Francisco, where they usually he held their international convenings. And they wanted to uh, have it come to New York City to coincide with the opening of the UN General Assembly and the millennium. And so they decided to come to New York and um, I came to New York to help them with that conference. And uh, part of the outreach was to uh, do outreach to possible keynote speakers at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, at that time, I met uh, the special representative of the Secretary General for the Office of Children in Armed Conflict. And he agreed to be a keynote speaker. And, uh, you know, we kept in touch about the logistics, et cetera, et cetera. And lo and behold, immediately after the conference, I was at the United Nations. He asked me to come to uh, be at his office. And so I was there for five years as his advisor and uh, dealt with the issue of children of, uh, and armed conflict and, you know, became an international advocate. Beautiful. So how do we, in, in our day-to-day lives, how do we start to, if we're not having these mystical experiences, begin to discover who we truly are? Well, that is the sacred journey of life. And it is a constant unfolding of coming to understand, who am I? And that is a perennial question to be able to understand that we are not the body, we are not the mind, but we are uh, something far greater. And it's like you try to encapsulate this immortal, eternal essence into a form and structure that inherently automatically limits you because the form and structure must ultimately go back to dust, um, but it is the instrument of our experience while we are in the form and structure. So we have to come to the state of Uh, discovering who we are and on that sacred journey that is constantly, you know, uh, revealing itself through our life experiences to ultimately understand that we are divine, immortal, spiritual beings encased in human form. Woohoo! A lot of people listening have Self-talk. I, I remember years ago, I was exploring all of spirituality. And one of the things I was doing was see, singing in a church choir. I was going to temple. I was going to church. I was going to Native American ceremonies. And I was singing in the choir. And I ended up meeting, I guess I was had like an interview with the, the reverend or somebody there. And, and I said, if we're all on a sacred journey, is it possible that we could make a bad decision and screw it up and come off of our sacred journey? And well, he he kicked me out of the choir for that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't be kicked off the sacred journey. Uh, you can have, you know, distractions. Mm-hmm. You can go down tributaries. Mm-hmm. But always we are in the great confluence of the evolutionary flow of human consciousness that is ever rising to the higher realms. And so along the way, though, you know, as with any great uh, stream, mm-hmm. it does have tributaries. So, you you know, you may flow and a little s- distraction here and a distraction there. And ultimately, though, we'll all end it up in the great ocean of oneness. I love that you call it the confluence of consciousness. I've never heard it before. It's so beautiful. We, therefore, even if we're in a tributary, we are still in the confluence. We are still on track and on path. So when we feel we are stuck, when we feel we are lost, we are still consciousness expanding. Correct. And our experiences helps to inform us, and uh, they too can be guideposts in our lives. And uh, because life can be very challenging, it can be very difficult, and we have all kinds of experiences along the way of our journey. Um, you know, it's uh, to in order to be able to move through the journey with greater acuity, um, you don't want to muck up your life by, you know, taking drugs, um, um, anything that would debilitate you in a way that is going to 
uh, cut down your ability to have that facility of that acuity that you need to be able to maintain flexibility and stay sharp and move with the sufficient degree of flexibility to, you know, meet life's various experiences. I love how you say flexibility because I've been sitting way too much. And this weekend I was moving all this stuff I was telling you about off air. And my back actually got sore and, and I went into my automatic writing, which is my way of, of tapping into the divine and hearing. And I was getting this flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. We need to get you more flexible for life. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that was actually the first lesson that the divine messenger gave to divine mother was flexibility. In other words, to be able to have that acuity, to be able to respond, be able to change with uh, life's experiences, to go with the flow so you don't become rigidified, not in your thinking uh, and not in your, um, you know, daily habits so that you become fixed. And she always used to give the example of a young branch is very supple and you can bend it. But, you know, the older branch is very stiff and fixed. And then when you try to bend it, it snaps. So flexibility is actually very important. So you can learn how to go with the flow. It's very difficult to do if you have rigidified thinking. And so that, that requires, is that the right word? A level of allowance and surrender. So if I went, if I went back to Hawaii and I put a palm tree next to the coast, and a storm comes along, that palm tree kind of surrenders and sways to whatever storms comes its way. If I go and transplant an oak tree there, which is very strong and very powerful and rigid, but does not surrender easily, it's going to get knocked over or snap. Right. All the roots will be, you know, <laughs> upended <laughs> and you have a big tree lying on its side yes. and, you know, off of its uh, connection with its roots to the ground. So, you know, these are Im important metaphors for us to keep in mind that flexibility is uh, very, very important to be able to maintain because you don't know from day to day what life experiences will come your way. And you have to be able to be able to respond and to keep that mind open and flexible as well as your heart open and flexible to be able to move, you know, move off of plan A, go to plan B, go to plan C and uh, keep that fluidity going. How important is a sense of humor for that? Oh, very important. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think God has a great sense of humor and God is full of irony. And uh, so, you know. <laughs> My twin tuning forks couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> so humor is always, uh, you know, wonderful medicine as well for healing. And um, I can't remember his name right now, but he had this, uh, is actually a very well-known name and it'll come to me probably at two o'clock this morning when this interview is over. <laughs> Which too but, will be a sense of humor from an irony from the universe. <laughs> right. I think it was uh, Bill Moyers. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. But in any event, he found that uh, it, it was very important as part of the healing process to watch comedy shows, to laugh. And of course, you have the laughing yoga and, you know, so different modalities of being able to bring joy and levity into to your life and why we so love comedians, you know, the quick wit and seeing the humor in all different scenarios in life. My wife and I have been through a whole series of mornings over this last year, um, including two miscarriages. And, and now one of our greatest forms of entertainment, it's very PG, but we will be there on the couch having tickle wars with each other. <laughs> And that just brings us into such a higher, I mean, you're crying at one point but, and, and or, you know, gasping for breath, but it brings you into such a higher state where it, Paul Selig, a, a great spiritual author in, in his uh, channeling, calls it, you go to the upper room. And when you're in that elevated state, when you're in that state of laughter, 
the entire world looks differently because the entire world, I believe, is different at that point. That's right. Um, you know, life uh, in creation, you have the good, the bad, the happy, the sad, and we're always moving between the pairs of opposites and all the gradations in between. But along the way, you know, to return to the heart of joy, because I do believe that God is infinite love, peace, harmony, and joy. And laughter is, is a huge part of that joy. To see the joy in someone else's heart and essence is also joyous for you. And so your joy is my joy and vice versa as well. Woohoo! <laughs> you mentioned that that uh, flexibility was the Divine Mother's, the first uh, lesson that she was given. Do you recall what her second was? Well, you know, she, um, she was taught how to work with the light. Mm -hmm. So in any event, uh, the mystical journey is that uh, this divine messenger came to her in the jungles of Waikiki yeah. and taught her how to work with the light. And uh, at the end um, said, uh, Sri Ramakrishna sent me to you. Well, Sri Ramakrishna is considered to be an avatar, but he passed away in 1886 mm -hmm. in India. So, and she met this divine messenger in 1972. So you know that it is not a physical possibility that someone who was deceased in 1886 would send uh, a living being to her yeah. in 1972. So this is a very, um, very mystical um, path. Um, and, you know, Sri Ramakrishna, who believed and um you know, talked about um, all the different pathways leading to the one great God. So therein is my interfaith work. So all the different um, pathways and accepting and respecting them mm -hmm. as, you know, uh, authentic roadways to the one great God, because we will all meet there in the same place. In the light. Correct. And the divine love, the essence of oneness. What does to work with the light? I talk about on this show to shine bright. And my wife, Jessica, always challenges me on this. She goes, what does it mean to people to shine bright? So I want to ask, what does it mean to work with the light? Well, you know, um, there are certain frequencies, but in any event, we don't need to get into the science of it all because, you know, I'm not a, a, a physicist and I can't, I'm, I'm not uh, in the lingo of the scientific world. However, for the lay person, the light is love. And light, of course, is light, which is also, you know, the humor. I mean, you know, that's why it's comedy is light. <laughs> but in any event, it is when people um, have a very developed inner spiritual life, I do believe that you can actually see their radiance. So, for example, um, Divine Mother actually looked like she was golden, especially as she was leaving the body. You know, she never wore any makeup. And she looked as if she just stepped off a ski slope from Aspen with this beautiful tan, rosy cheeks and lipstick. And she was just golden, literally golden. And uh, But she was always very radiant. Her whole essence was very radiant and there was a profound beauty about her that kept me riveted to her i just could not take my eyes off of her and i have seen this radiance uh, in people who do developed this inner essence that is deeply connected to the divine with, through whatsoever path whether they be buddhist or you know christian or um but it is this remembrance of the sacred name and the essence of the divine that is cultivated from within and they literally become radiant instruments of the divine beautiful 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 we all have that inside of us correct 
Correct. How do we begin to cultivate or rediscover that in ourselves? Well, through your direct relationship and cultivating that direct relationship with God within the sacred chamber of your own heart. So the true church, the true temple is already within you, the closest of all, because it is where the, you know, heart of the divine resides. And so, you know, it's just, uh, divine mother always said, I'll show you the shortcut. And she'd point to her head and immediately drop it to her heart. So that was a shortcut. She goes pretty short, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So it's this essence of coming within and cultivating the heart of love, compassion, kindness, and all those qualities that the great masters talk about. Uh, because, you know, we are in relationship uh, with ourselves and relationship with others. And how we treat ourselves is actually projected outwards and how we behave with others. So it's very important to do the purification and the development of the inner spiritual life mm -hmm. so that what we are cultivating within is made manifest outwardly and the beautiful garden that we cultivate within can then be shared with others as a beautiful bounty of the abundance of the divine in all of God's radiance of love. You're a poet. I absolutely love this. I love it. Do you believe we're scared to cultivate it or to remember who we truly are? I think that uh, it's not so much fear because we all want to return to our divine essence. In, in actuality, we're always in the divine essence. We just have to remember that we are. Um, so, you know, that's part of the spiritual journey is to be able to do the inner work, the inner discovery, and to also learn that you cannot hate yourself and love another, that you have to be able to move with yourself too, with loving kindness, compassion, understanding that who you then are can be shared, uh, with others from that profound place that is sacred and really is the essence of who you are. Thank you. There's a question I wrote down and I had a discussion with self, with higher self as I wrote this down and I said, are you trying to give her a trick question? Where is this coming from? And I heard, just write it down. And it kind of flows along with what you just said. What's more important, love or forgiveness? And maybe I need to include self-forgiveness in this. In the high state, there really is nothing to forgive. Because that is all part of the experiences that are passing by, passing by. And, uh, you know, forgiveness is important uh, when you consider that we too have hurt many people. And just as we would like to be forgiven for whatever transgressions and harm we have, it may have caused someone else, so too it's very important to be able to have that capacity to forgive others who we feel may have also wounded us. But in the high state where there's nothing to forgive, it is in that essence of supreme love that we are all each other's teachers and teaching us how to overcome wounds and hurts and come to that essence of pure love. And in that state, there is really nothing to forgive because we're all helping each other. You know, like all the grains of rice, scrub, scrub, scrub in a pot so we can <laughs> get rid of the coverings mm. and, you know, get all, um, you know, together. And uh, that is the supreme harmony. And in that, uh, these are just life experiences passing by. I've got the rice in my bowl and I'm going scrub, scrub, scrub with the water on it. And first what comes out is not clear, but as I keep working the rice together, Correct. clarity arises. Well, it's Correct. already there, always there. Right. And so, you know, it's important. We, we need each other um, to be, you know, scrubbing and rubbing against each other uh, because we're all teachers and we're all students of life. Thank you. I want to double back to something you said. I believe you said that self-hatred and love or sending love to another cannot exist if you have hatred toward yourself. 
where does that come from? What do we do about that? Well, you know, a lot of times people have uh, horrific experiences, and um, but they're so horrific that they don't feel that they can even talk about them. Mm-hmm. And so they have, uh, they can very much have self-loathing, thinking it's their fault or they're bad. This is why it's happened to them. And, um, you know, this is where, you know, Mother Teresa said that the greatest poverty is the spiritual poverty. So it's this absence of love, having someone present in your life where it's very difficult for you to be able to experience that love because you yourself are filled with, um, you know, self-loathing through whatsoever experiences you may have had. And when you have the um, really the profound privilege of meeting someone who is present for you in that unconditional love, without judgment, just pure acceptance, and you have the sense of trust where you can just share, that sharing that takes you out of this deep, dark place of secrecy is very freeing. And then you find that in the sharing of what is so horrible to you in your mind, that there is just love for you there. Um, that it becomes a source of great freedom for you. And that in and of itself turns into an opportunity for you to actually experience loving yourself because someone has stood by you and really loved you. And that's why it's so important for us to be able to share love because you don't know what crosses people bear in their hearts, what wounds they have. And so, you know, we just really have to be present in the moment, fully present for someone. Thank you. How important is compassion today? And I want to emphasize today because it's a world where there seems to be a lot of woolly bullying going on. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I always you, you say like my that, term there. <laughs> yeah. Well, for for me the bully is the weakest person. Uh in any group, uh in any country, uh because um anyone who is truly strong inside and wholesome is more than happy to um you know want to see Each person experiences their highest potential and becomes your biggest cheerleader and, you know, really wishing for you the very best and encouraging you. But the bully is extremely insecure and has very low self-esteem and their measure of being able to be one up is if you're one down or more. So this is their way of finding their essence of, um, you know, the sense of superiority over others. And that uh, lack of humility speaks really to someone who is very unwholesome, has low self-esteem, and is very insecure, and is the weakest of them all. So if we pull on this string, they probably also need our love the most. Yes, our love and our prayers. Because they too need healing. Woohoo! You've done a lot of work with kids. You spoke about your time, specifically in the UN, working with kids. What have you learned from this experience, and what do we need to know that we may not even be aware of? Well, you see, um, when you have, when you feel, because it's like, you know, children in armed conflict, that's right. the work that I was doing at the UN. And oftentimes you would hear the stories of the child soldiers. And of course, you know, oftentimes they were drugged. uh, They were forcibly removed from their homes and conscripted involuntarily. And um, in the drug state, you know, they were made to do very heinous things. Um, And for some, they felt that there was a lot of power in the gun uh, because then they could uh, control Uh, life and death over another person. So, you know, 
is that sense of false power where you find your essence, your power in uh, at the end of a gun uh, to strike fear and terror in the heart of another, uh, that too is a sign of utter helplessness that you have to seek power through an external instrument that can bring death to others. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, to really love our children and to help them to be truly strong inside and wholesome so that they can understand that true strength and true wholesomeness is to be able to be together in harmony and respect and wholesomeness because you yourself are wholesome from within so you don't have to feel threatened and you do understand that the realization of each person's the beauty of their own potential to grow in wondrous ways is a mark your joy in that is a mark of your own wholesomeness thank you i just watched a very silly i don't even know why i did i felt like it I went for it, watched a very silly kid movie yesterday having to do with the cutest little alien. And these kids felt disempowered to do anything when this whole situation was going on because they were, quote, just a kid. What's wrong with those three words? Well, I think it's wonderful to be just a kid. <laughs> Okay, you know. I'll buy that in a completely different way. I'll take that, Audrey. <laughs> <laughs> because when we think about, you know, a child, you think of someone who's uh, young and, you know, open and trusting and, um, you know, until life experiences uh, teach them many things otherwise. But it is that kind of freshness, that kind of spontaneity, that joy in the moment that can take delight, you know, whether it's a coloring, a coloring book, or, you know, seeing um, a beautiful rose. I mean, whatever it is that's so pure and childlike. And that's, uh, you know, I think no matter how old you get, there's a child in there. And just loves to be a child. Um, when my mother passed away at age 99. And, uh, you know, one of her uh, pleasures in life was to get an ice cream cone. So I'd say, hey, mom, you want an ice cream cone? And she'd just brighten up, you know. And she would say, it always reminds me of being a child. And just enjoying eating an ice cream cone. And they're in such simplicity. And finding the joy and beauty in, you know, having an activity like that. And so it was her way of instantly returning to childhood where you can experience sheer joy in such small little things that are actually quite big. And all children experience, um, you know, big experiences that seem to be very small, but they're not. Yeah. If you've ever read the play Our Town. You know, and... you're the second person to mention that in the last two weeks. Actually, and I mentioned it as well. Give me more because this is fascinating. Well, Emily, you know, um, you know, basically the long and the short of it is have someone passes to the other side and has an opportunity to return to earth and was uh, told just choose an ordinary day. Don't choose something that was you know, really special and had uh, the opportunity to go back and just see an ordinary day and just get totally blown away by seeing how in the seemingly ordinariness of daily life, there was so much incredible beauty, so much incredible love. And so too, you know, in the seemingly ordinariness of everyday living is the profound hand of God and the grandeur of God. So, you know, I observe a Divine Mother when she was washing the dishes, yeah. when she was cooking a meal, and everything was done with so much love and so much mindfulness. And there was great delight in seeing the grandeur of life, capital L, 
in these seemingly ordinary actions in life. But that is life. That is the beautiful journey of life, and every moment is incredibly sacred. Is that something we can? Uh, obviously, we can cultivate it over time, but is there a way to make a conscious choice to view the world in a different way, to remember? I mean, we all now, oh my God, I've got to drive someplace, there's traffic, there's this, there's that. Can you imagine if somebody had given you the keys to the car and said, you got to drive in traffic, but I'm going to give you the car at 14, 15, 16? <laughs> you might be really scared, but you might be going, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> Can we just flip that switch? Yes, if you this is what uh, you know a lot of these spiritual teachers do. They teach you meditation, they teach you mindfulness. They actually help you develop a spiritual discipline to be able to be consciously aware and to reframe things so that you are not burdened by the seemingly inconveniences of life or whatever it is, whether it's stuck in traffic or you can reframe it and say oh, this is wonderful. I have time for myself. And, you know, and uh, if you have a mantra, then you can say the mantra and it's your opportunity to practice and to, you know, have that sacred vibration emanating from you to all the other people stuck in traffic. <laughs> well, I say you can be an ambassador of love while you're out there. You can Absolutely. literally be, sh be to the person in front of you, to the person with a monodigital response, hopefully not behind you, but you can just be, I send love. I send love and put yourself in that state. Correct. So this is also practicing flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. uh, your, the flexibility is to be able to be willing to reframe your experience and to always move it to that realm of love so you don't get frustrated and angry and no road rage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's go from love rage and uh, love rage. And actually, actually, I've got to mention childlike joy. If I take... Uh, my wife out and I and, and now now I know what I'm going to do on the way to picking her up from the airport later today. I'm going to show up with mochi ball ice cream for her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's mango, there's strawberry. There's <laughs> and she is going to have that childlike joy. How do we take this, what we're learning today, what we're rediscovering today? And I feel it's important. I call it the two-step dance. It's one thing to cultivate on the inside, but we get to step forward as well. What does that look like? What can we do today, particularly when we felt fairly disempowered, to make a difference in this world? Well, you know, uh, Mother Teresa said, we cannot do great things, but we can do little things with great love. So every moment that we live is an opportunity to be an expression of that love. And whether it's, you know, to give your wife mochi balls that you know she loves and make her happy and that brings joy to you, you know, it's the, it's the little things in life, cumulatively, that becomes your legacy. So when you look back, you can see, you know, how did you spend your life? And to the extent that you have shared great love with others in all the little ways every day that we live, through our expressions of concern, through saying a kind word, um, you know, sharing something loving in whatever way. And it doesn't have to be grand. And oftentimes it's not grand at all. It's just the little things that you do that starts to, you know, it's like you have a garden. You have to pull it one weed at a time, <laughs> but that's how you get a beautiful garden. You, you know, through, you put in the work and you're diligent about it and you have to tend your inner garden and, you know, ensure that you are cultivating the loving kindness, the heart of compassion, uh, the loving words, the loving actions in all the little ways. And, you know, when you move from that place of love, people do feel it. Thank you. And you, you just brought me back to our garden on Maui, which we never really fully got under control. But it was such an honor. I actually enjoyed the process. 
of pulling, I would send it love because on the one hand, I don't want to kill or harm anything. On the other hand, it's all energy. But I would send love and pull and send love and pull and tending that garden made me feel so, so good. Exactly. Because plants have consciousness too, you know, and when we can be expressions of appreciation to the beauty that they bring into our lives. I mean, you can actually go into the bliss just looking at one flower and how that beautiful divine intelligence, the divine creator of all there is, could actually have the genius to create something so profound and exquisite and beautiful, so fragrant. And it's just, you know, life is just full of awe and wonder everywhere we look. (laughs) Woohoo! <laughs> so what's your mission today, Audrey? My mission today is just to share, to be with you, and to enjoy all of the people who are listening to this, and to just share love. Thank you, thank you. And any last words of wisdom before we jump into a meditation? You are a perfect child of God, immortal, eternal, and already in God's light. Woohoo! I love it, Audrey. <laughs> Is there a book or website or anything you want to send people to or anywhere you want to send people to? Well, um, I do have a website. It's the Light of Awareness International Spiritual Family. Yep. And you can learn more about, uh, you know, the spiritual family. And basically, it's just love and how we share love and in that process how we actualize the living reality of god in our daily lives for god is love i have no other words but woohoo <laughs> <laughs> it's a cure all for everything it's just a burst and blast of love <laughs> so would you mind leading us in a guided meditation then Yes, it'd be my honor to do so. If you're driving down the road, let's do this out of love when you get home and have a nice quiet place. Yeah, okay. (laughs) So we just close our eyes and just relax and just sit comfortably. And we just start moving out of our minds and go straight to our hearts and start dropping down, down, down into our hearts. I want you to see yourself opening your heart opening your heart and there I want you to feel the loving presence of the divine in your heart that loving essence that light that is full of joy and I want you to bring into this loving presence all those people with whom you have concern of whom you love and whoever you want to bring into the divine light And I want you to feel the joy you experience with them, to be one with them in this profound, profound love. And feel the love from your heart moving to their hearts, receiving your love, and open your heart and receive their love. And always see your loved ones happy, wholesome, well. For that is the reality of who each one is as a perfect child of God, immortal, eternal, and already in God's light. And so we bless all those gathered here today, knowing that we are one with them. And there is no true power in the universe. There's only one power in the universe. And that power is God. And God is love. So that is the essence of where we move and live and breathe and all of that contained within the sacred chamber of our own hearts where we join together now with all of those we love, all of those we pray for and are concerned about and all those who need our prayers of love. And so it is that we bless all living beings in this and all universes, arising from the one great God, 
from whom we shall all return and with whom we are always inseparably one. Amen, amen, and amen to all and all living in the sacred divine love. Amen, amen, and amen. Oh. Oh. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. May the infinite love, peace, harmony, and joy of God be with you this day and all the days of your lives. Amen. And thank you so much for this privilege to be with each and every one of you. Blessed art thou. Blessed art thou, blessed art thou, O beloved child of God. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. Where did that ohm come from, Audrey? <laughs> 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 got tears that was absolutely beautiful and 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 the depth of that ohm was just holy smokes audrey <laughs> thank you so much this has been so beautiful i cannot thank you enough for being here today well, thank you and all of the good work that you do to help everyone move to the higher realms of consciousness from that sacred place within ourselves that speaks to love. Thank you, Michael. Woohoo! Thank you so much, Audrey. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, discover your own inner greatness, and begin sharing your light with the world today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And infinite blessings to you and all the good works that you do. And to you as well. I just had the most beautiful, heartwarming interview with Audrey Kiyotagawa. To check out more incredible videos on opening your heart and discovering your greatness, click here, subscribe below.